Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind-the-narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels— and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Chapter 17. From Cape Horn to the Amazon. How I got onto the platform, I have no idea. Perhaps the Canadian had carried me there. But I breathed. I inhaled the vivifying sea air. My two companions were getting drunk with the fresh particles. The other unhappy men had been so long without food that they could not with impunity indulge in the simplest ailments that were given them. We, on the contrary, had no ends to restrain ourselves. We could draw this air freely into our lungs, and it was the breeze. The breeze alone that filled us with this keen enjoyment. Ah, said Conceal, how delightful this oxygen is. Master need not fear to breathe it. There's enough for everybody. Ned Land did not speak, but he opened his jaws wide enough to frighten a shark. Our strength soon returned, and when I looked round me, I saw we were alone on the platform. The foreign seamen in the Nautilus were contented with the air that circulated in the interior. None of them had come to drink in the open air. The first words I spoke were words of gratitude and thankfulness to my two companions. Ned and Conceal had prolonged my life during the last hours of this long agony. All my gratitude could not repay such devotion. My friends, said I, we are bound one to the other forever, and I am under infinite obligations to you. Which I shall take advantage of, exclaimed the Canadian. What do you mean? said Conceal. I mean that I shall take you with me when I leave this infernal Nautilus. Well, said Conceal, after all this, are we going right? Yes, I replied. For we are going the way of the sun, and here the sun is in the north. No doubt, said Ned Land. But it remains to be seen whether he will bring the ship into the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. That is, into frequented or deserted seas. I cannot answer that question. And I feared that Captain Nemo would rather take us to the vast ocean that touches the coasts of Asia and America at the same time. He would thus complete the tour around the submarine world and return to those waters in which the Nautilus could sail freely. We ought before long to settle this important point. The Nautilus went at a rapid pace. The polar circle was soon passed, and the course shaped for Cape Horn. We were off the American Point, March 31st, at 7 o'clock in the evening. Then all our past sufferings were forgotten. The remembrance of that imprisonment in the ice was effaced from our minds. We only thought of the future— Captain Nemo did not appear again either in the drawing room or on the platform. The point shown each day on the planisphere and marked by the lieutenant showed me the exact direction of the Nautilus. Now on that evening, it was evident, to my great satisfaction, that we were going back to the north by the Atlantic. The next day, April 1st, when the Nautilus ascended to the surface some minutes before noon, we sighted land to the west. It was Terra del Fuego which the first navigators named thus from seeing the quantity of smoke that rose from the natives' huts. The coast seemed low to me, but in the distance rose high mountains. I even thought I had a glimpse of Mount Sarmiento, that rises 2,070 yards above the level of the sea with a very pointed summit, 
which according as it is misty or clear is a sign of fine or of wet weather. At this moment, the peak was clearly defined against the sky. The Nautilus, diving again under the water, approached the coast, which was only some few miles off. From the glass windows in the drawing room, I saw long seaweeds and gigantic fuci and varech, of which the open polar sea contained so many specimens. With their sharp polished filaments, they measured about 300 yards in length, real cables thicker than one's thumb and having great tenacity. They're often used as ropes for vessels. Another weed, known as velp, with leaves four feet long, buried in the coral concretions, hung at the bottom. It served as nest and food for myriads of crustacea and mollusks, crabs and cuttlefish. Their seals and otters had splendid repasts, eating the flesh of fish with sea vegetables according to the English fashion. Over this fertile and luxuriant ground, the Nautilus passed with great rapidity. Towards evening, it approached the Falkland group, the rough summits of which I recognized the following day. The depth of the sea was moderate. On the shores, our nets brought in beautiful specimens of seaweed, and particularly a certain fucus, the roots of which were filled with the best mussels in the world. Geese and ducks fell by dozens on the platform, and soon took their places in the pantry on board. When the last heights of the Falklands had disappeared from the horizon, the Nautilus sank to between 20 and 25 yards, and followed the American coast. Captain Nemo did not show himself. Until the 3rd of April, we did not quit the shores of Patagonia, sometimes under the ocean, sometimes at the surface. The Nautilus passed beyond the large estuary formed by the Uruguay. Its direction was northwards and followed the long windings of the coast of South America. We had then made 1,600 miles since our embarkation in the seas of Japan. About 11 o'clock in the morning, the Tropic of Capricorn was crossed on the 37th meridian, and we passed Cape Frio standing out to sea. Captain Nemo, to Ned Land's great displeasure, did not like the neighborhood of the inhabited coasts of Brazil, for we went at a giddy speed. Not a fish, not a bird of the swiftest kind could follow us, and the natural curiosities of these seas escaped all observation. The speed was kept up for several days, and in the evening of the 9th of April we sighted the most westerly point of South America that forms Cape San Roque. But then the Nautilus swerved again, and sought the lowest depth of a submarine valley which is between this cape and Sierra Leone on the African coast. This valley bifurcates the parallel of the Antilles and terminates at the mouth by the enormous depression of 9,000 yards. In this place, the geological basin of the ocean forms, as far as the Lesser Antilles, a cliff to three and a half miles perpendicular in height, and at the parallel of the Cape Verde Islands, an other wall not less considerable, that encloses thus all the sunk continent of the Atlantic. The bottom of this immense valley is dotted with some mountains, that give to these submarine places a picturesque aspect. I speak, moreover, from the manuscript charts that were in the library of the Nautilus, charts evidently due to Captain Nemo's hand, and made after his personal observations. For two days, the desert and deep waters were visited by means of the inclined plains. The Nautilus was furnished with long diagonal broadsides, which carried it to all elevations, but on the 11th of April, it rose suddenly and land appeared at the mouth of the Amazon River, a vast estuary, the embouchure of which is so considerable that it freshens the seawater for the distance of several leagues. The equator was crossed. Twenty miles to the west were the Guianas, a French territory on which we could have found an easy refuge. But a stiff breeze was blowing, and the furious waves would not have allowed a single boat to face them, Ned Land understood that, no doubt, for he spoke not a word about it. For my part, I made no allusion to his schemes of flight, for I would not urge him to make an attempt that must inevitably fail. I made the time pass pleasantly by interesting studies. During the days of April 11th and 12th, the Nautilus did not leave the surface of the sea, and the net brought in a marvelous haul of zoophytes, fish, and reptiles. Some zoophytes had been fished up by the chain of the nets, they were for the most part beautiful phytacalines, belonging to the Actinidian family, and among other species, the Phylactylus protexta, peculiar to that part of the ocean, with a little cylindrical trunk, ornamented with vertical lines speckled with red dots, crowning a marvelous blossoming of tentacles. As to the mollusks, they consisted of some I had already observed, turtellas, olive porphyras, with regular lines intercrossed, 
with red spots standing out plainly against the flesh. Odd terraceras, like petrified scorpions, translucid hylias, argonauts, cuttlefish, excellent eating, and certain species of calmars that naturalists of antiquity have classed among the flying fish, and that serve principally for bait for cod fishing. I had now an opportunity of studying several species of fish on these shores, amongst the cartiglinous ones, Petromynzias prica, a sort of eel, fifteen inches long with a greenish head, violet fins, grey-blue back, brown belly, silvered and sewn with bright spots, the pupil of the eye encircled with gold, a curious animal that the current of the Amazon had drawn to the sea, for they inhabit fresh waters, tuberculated streaks with pointed snouts and a long loose tail, armed with a long jagged sting, little sharks, a yard long, gray and whitish skin and several rows of teeth bent back, that are generally known by the name of pantofles, vespertilios, a kind of red isosceles triangle, half a yard long, to which pectorals are attached by fleshy prolongations that make them look like bats, but that their horny appendage, situated near the nostrils, has given them the name of sea unicorns. Lastly, some species of ballistae, the curasavian, whose spots were of a brilliant color, and the capriscus of clear violet, and with varying shades like a pigeon's throat. I end here this catalog, which is somewhat dry perhaps, but very exact, with a series of bony fish that I observed in passing belonging to the apteronauts, and whose snout is white as snow, the body of a beautiful black, marked with a very long, loose fleshy strip, and on Tognathes, armed with spikes, sardines nine inches long, glittering with a bright silver light, a species of mackerel provided with two anal fins, centronotes of a blackish tint that are fished for with torches, longfish, two yards in length, with fat flesh, white and firm, which, when they are arc fresh, taste like eel, and when dry, like smoked salmon, labries half red, covered with scales only at the bottom of the dorsal and anal fins, Grasoptera, on which gold and silver blend their brightness with that of the ruby and topaz. Golden-tailed spares, the flesh of which is extremely delicate, and whose phosphorescent properties betray them in the midst of the waters. Orange-colored spares with long tongues. Migries with gold caudal fins. Dark thorn tails, anableps of surinam, etc. Notwithstanding this etc., I must not omit to mention fish that conceal will long remember and with good reason. One of our nets had hauled up a sort of very flat rayfish, which, with the tail cut off, formed a perfect disc and weighed twenty ounces. It was white underneath, red above, with large round spots of dark blue encircled with black, very glossy skin terminating in a bilobed fin. Laid out on the platform, it struggled, tried to turn itself by convulsive movements, and made so many efforts that one last turn nearly sent it into the sea but Conceal, not wishing to let the fish go, rushed to it, and before I could prevent him, had seized it with both hands. In a moment, he was overthrown, his legs in the air and half his body paralyzed, crying, Oh, master, master, help me! It was the first time the poor boy had spoken to me so familiarly. The Canadian and I took him up and rubbed his contracted arms till he became sensible. The unfortunate Conceal had attacked a cramp fish of the most dangerous kind, Kumana. This odd animal in a medium conductor like water strikes fish at several yards distance, so great is the power of its electric organ, the two principal surfaces of which do not measure less than 27 square feet. The next day, April 12th, the Nautilus approached the Dutch coast, near the mouth of the Moroni. There, several groups of sea cows herded together. They were manatees that, like the dugong and the stellara, belong to the Skinian order. These beautiful animals, peaceable and inoffensive from 18 to 21 feet in length, weigh at least 1,600 weight. I told Ned Land and Conceal that provident nature had assigned an important role to these mammalia. Indeed, they, like the seals, are designed to graze on the submarine prairies, and thus destroy the accumulation of weed that obstructs the tropical rivers. And do you know, I added... What has been the result since men have almost entirely annihilated this useful race? That the putrefied weeds have poisoned the air, and the poisoned air causes the yellow fever that desolates these beautiful countries. 
Enormous vegetations are multiplied under the torrid seas, and the evil is irresistibly developed from the mouth of the Rio de la Plata to Florida. If we are to believe to Sanel, this plague is nothing to what it would be if the seas were cleaned of whales and seals, and infested with pulps, medusae, and cuttlefish. They would become immense centers of infection, since their waves would not possess these vast stomachs that God had charged to infest the surface of the seas. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today. Well, we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.